My name is Dr. Jane Turner, J-A-N-E, T-U-R-N-E-R. Morning, Dr. Turner. Good morning. Uh, because you are encased, it's really important you talk into the, the microphone so everybody hears you, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could you please introduce yourself to the jury? My name is Dr. Jane Turner. I'm a forensic pathologist. And Dr. Turner, what city do you live in? In St. Louis, Missouri. When you say a, a forensic pathologist, have you also worked as a medical examiner? Yes. Are those terms used synonymously sometimes? Yes. Okay. Can you tell the jury a little bit about your educational background? I, I received all of my degrees from St. Louis University. I'm a native St. Louisan, um, so I have a BA in biology from St. Louis University, a PhD in physiology from St. Louis University, and physiology is the study of how the body works, and I have a medical degree from St. Louis University. Where did you begin working after medical school? After medical school, I started my training in anatomic and clinical pathology at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. Um, I then later came back to St. Louis and completed that training at St. John's Mercy Medical Center in Creve Coeur, Missouri. What other types of work have you done in your career? Well, I, I did additional training in forensic pathology, uh, fellowship training at St. Louis University. And uh, once I completed that training, I was hired by St. Louis University as faculty to work at the City of St. Louis Medical Examiner's Office. And when was that? Do you recall? That was 1999 or 2000. Okay. Uh, what have you done since then? I worked for 18 years at St. Louis University as a professor. I rose through the ranks to become a full professor. And when I um, was working for St. Louis University, I worked primarily at the City of St. Louis Medical Examiner's Office, performing medical legal autopsies and testifying in court as needed. I also was teaching medical students and residents and I became the program director for the forensic pathology training program, so I did that for a number of years. And I also took on um, the directorship of the autopsy service at the hospital. So at the medical examiner's office, I was performing medical legal autopsies. And then at St. Louis University Hospital, I was um, performing and overseeing the performance of hospital autopsies, which are not medical legal um, or, or not forensic cases. How many total years have you worked as a medical examiner? Well, uh, so as a medical examiner in the city of St. Louis for 18 years, and then I've practiced as a forensic pathologist after that. So a total of almost 25 years as a forensic pathologist. How many autopsies have you performed? Well over 5,000. Have you ever been published in any medical journals before? I have. Do you have any special certifications? Um, I have certifications from the American Board of Pathology in anatomic and clinical pathology and in forensic pathology. Do you have any special certifications relating to child death pathology? Yes, uh, the state of Missouri has conferred upon me um, a certified child um, forensic pathologist or pediatric forensic pathologist. And what does that give you the ability to do in the state of Missouri? It, um, they've given me per permission to perform medical legal autopsies in pediatric cases. Have you performed autopsies in pediatric cases before? I have. Do you know how many times? My best estimate is around 400, maybe more. Have you ever testified as an expert before? I have. About how many times? In a, a trial setting, over 200 times. How many times have you testified as an expert for the prosecution? 
About 150 times. Okay. So for the defense, 50 or around there? Does that around 40. I've, I've testified in civil cases as well. Okay. Now today you are testifying uh, for the defense, correct? Yes. And are you being paid for the time that you've spent reviewing this case and for testifying? Yes. All right. uh, do you own your own uh, firm or consulting firm now? I do. When did you start that? I started that a few years after I completed my training in forensic pathology. I, I was approached by attorneys um, at some point after I completed my training asking me to review cases for them. So the most of the time that you've been practicing as a forensic pathologist, you've also been consulting? Yes. Okay. Do you know how many states you have been testified? I'm sorry. Do you know how many states you have testified in as an expert? I would estimate around 10, maybe 12. Okay. Your Honor, at this time, defense would tender Dr. Jane Turner as an expert in forensic pathology. Any objection? No, Your Honor. All right. She will testify as an expert in forensic pathology. Dr. Turner, have you ever worked on a case as a forensic pathologist involving decomposed remains? Yes. What type of challenges does that create when you're working with decomposed remains? Well, the, the degree of decomposition can obscure findings. Um, the degree of comp decomposition can interfere with the ability to perform toxicology testing with um, results that you can correlate with cause of death. Uh, decomposition can um, interfere with uh, forensic pathologist's ability to determine cause and manner of death. Did you review any materials in this case? For the yes. case we're here for? Yes. Um, do you recall what, what all materials you reviewed? I reviewed Quite a few materials. Um, certainly the autopsy report, um, seen photographs, uh, police investigative reports, um, there was DNA testing, um, there, there was an effort to um, identify the clothing, the, you know, who purchased the clothing on the child, that was found on the child. I reviewed uh, anthropology reports, toxicology report, and uh, autopsy photographs. I'd like to begin with the toxicology portion of this case. You said you did review toxicology reports in relation uh, to this case? Yes. Do you have an opinion on the, the findings? Yes. Okay, what's your opinion? that the toxicology testing of the decomposing skeletal muscle found the presence of Tylenol and Benadryl. Okay. Are you able to tell anything about uh, what the dosages would be uh, for this child for these two medications? No. Is it fair to say these, these could represent a toxic dose of the drugs? That's possible. Could these levels represent a therapeutic dose? Yes, that's possible as well. And can you explain to the jury what does a, a therapeutic dose mean? A therapeutic dose means the, the target range of blood concentration uh, for the drug that has um, the desired effect. But we're not looking at blood in this case, we're looking at, at skeletal muscle. And because we're looking at skeletal muscles, is that the reason why you can't determine any dosages? Yes. With a therapeutic dose, if William was given a therapeutic dose, would he have experienced any pain from these drugs? No. Could these levels represent a trace dose? They, they could represent any range of, of dose or any range of, of blood concentration at the time of his death. It's, it, it, Testing skeletal muscle is useful only for telling you that the drug was present, not what the drug concentration was at the time of death. Okay. 
Now, on a, if this was a, a trace dose that William uh, received, you would not expect any pain uh, to be caused by that as well, correct? Correct. All right. I'd like to talk a little bit about the uh, anthropology uh, portion. You also reviewed some uh, reports from anthropologists, is that right? Yes. Okay. All right. Did you review anything in the case materials concerning a fracture to the right zygomatic arch? Yes. Okay. Do you have an opinion about this fracture? Yes. All right. Could you please share with the jury ultimately what your opinion is? There, uh, the anthropologist that reviewed the, the skeletal remains uh, indicated that there was evidence of animal scavenging. The absence of a portion of the zygomatic arch is in keeping with that observation. Can you explain a little bit to the jury how a fracture like this uh, would get, be caused by animal scavenging? It uh, can be caused by animal scavenging from gnawing. It could be caused from animal scavenging from um, the animals moving the skull and, and breaking that bone. That bone is, is a small, um, you know, not very thick bone in, on the face. And what evidence in this case supports the idea that this fracture would, was caused by animal scavenging? Some of the other bones demonstrate um, changes that are in keeping with animal scavenging or animal gnawing on the bones. Can you describe those other, uh, the other damaged bones that inform your opinion? Well, one example is the mandible or the jaw. Um, the ends of the mandible are, um, are rough and irregular um, in keeping with an animal having gnawed on the, the two sides of the mandible. Dr. Turner, I'm going to show you what's already been marked, or I'm sorry, already entered as State's Exhibit 65. And we're going to go to figure 21. I'm sorry, figure, figure 20. Can you tell the jury what we're looking at in figure 20? We're, we're looking at the uh, mandible, at William's mandible, um, at one end of the mandible. So the end we're looking at is um, the right side at the, at the joint. Um, but we're looking at the bone after it has been altered um, through the process, process of restoration. Can you, what do you mean by altered? Uh, someone has applied uh, material to replace the missing part of the, the end of bone. Now, when you say that, are you talking about the, the dark part on the end here? The dark part, also the cottony material. Okay. I'm going to show you next States Exhibit 46. What are we looking at here? This is a photograph that was taken of the mandible at the scene, and um, we're looking at the irregular ends of the mandible, the right um, on the left side of the screen, and the left end at the top um, left part of, of the screen. And you can see that there, the ends are not symmetrical. They should be the same length and shape and appearance, and, and they are not. Is it typical to, or is the mandible uh, typically have these rough edges? No. On the ends? No. Now, you said that this was, the pieces on the end were added in, in restoration. Are you aware of, of why that would have happened in this case? My understanding is that it was part of the process in trying to identify William in, in reconstructing his facial appearance. I'm 
going to show you next uh, the same exhibit, state 65, figure 21. Is this more of the reconstruction material that you're referencing? Yes. From your view between this picture and the the other, uh, I'm sorry, the scene photograph, is some of that damage that you saw that you mentioned in the scene photograph covered up here by the clay or, or cotton or whatever that is? Yes. Can you still see other damage that you believe is indicative of animal scavenging? Well, the the top surface appears rough and irregular, which uh, would not be typical of, of a bone surface. Go down to figure 22. Is this that same bone we were already talking about? Yes. Okay. And do you note any additional uh, damage to the bone we haven't talked about already? No. Next, I'm going to jump to figure 3 from the same exhibit. Is there any signif anything significant? In this picture, in in this picture, we're looking at the left side of William's skull with the mandible in place, and um, you can appreciate at the joint area at the end of the left mandible that there's some of that black material as part of the restoration process. Right. And is it your understanding through your, your review of this? Parts of the bone were missing there, and that's why something had to be added to restore it? Yes. So going back a little ways. What are we looking at in this photograph? We're looking at the right side of the skull with the mandible and with the restorations apparent. Um, in in black and um, uh, and I'm not sure about this other discoloration, this yellowish discoloration. If that's also part of the restoration. Now, does this photograph show the the break in the zygomatic arch? Yes, it does. To your knowledge, was that piece of bone ever recovered? No, it was not. How would you explain that in your experience? Um, it could have been digested by a scavenging animal. Is there anything about the zygomatic arch that makes it prone to damage from animal scavenging? Well, with animal scavenging, um, the animals, and I have experience with rats um, having done this, and in some cases I've had where people died in rat-infested uh, homes, so rats will um, gnaw at the nose and the cheek and the, and the chin. Anything that's protruding, they'll gnaw at it. Are you aware that uh, Dr. Meredith Tice uh, found that there was not scoring or scraping or furrowing on the zygomatic arch. Are you aware of that opinion? Yes. How do you justify that opinion with yours that this is caused by animal scavenging? Well, again, if either it was from gnawing activity, which Dr. Tice is of the opinion that there's no evidence of that for the zygomatic arch, <coughs> but there, there is elsewhere on the skull, or that that piece of bone was broken off um, due to the activity of animal scavenging. Dr. Turner, in your opinion, is there any anything in this case that suggests or leads you to believe this injury was caused before death? There's there's no supporting evidence for that. I'd like to talk to you next a little bit about the time of death. Okay. Do you have any opinion on, on when William died or how long William was, was in the woods? No, I, I don't know. Could it be 
less than a month. Yes, that's possible. What type of things affect decomposition time? There are numerous variables. So uh, the mass that you're dealing with, so the size of the individual, um, exposure to sunlight, exposure to heat um, or cold, uh, dampness, um, and then on top of decomposition, you have uh, insect activity and animal scavenging activity. And animal or insect scavenging activity could speed up the process of decomposition? Yes. Are there any, um, are there any pathological issues or causes of death that could speed up? potential decomposition? Um, someone who um, dies with an infection, sepsis, fever, so an elevated body temperature can accelerate the initial phases of decomposition. I'd like to start uh, next talking about some possible causes of death uh, for William. Have you formed opinions on other potential possible causes of death for William? Well, my opinion is that the cause of death is undetermined or unknown, but certainly there are numerous uh, possible causes of death for uh, a child um, and a child living in this environment. Could you tell the jury a little bit about what exposure means as, as far as a cause of death? In this case, the exposure would be hypothermia or cold exposure, so dying from exposure to cold, so freezing to death. <coughs> Could that be a potential cause of death in this case? Yes. Uh, you mentioned sepsis earlier. Could you tell us a, a little bit about what sepsis is? Sepsis is a potentially um, fatal illness, and it is... It is the body's inappropriate response to the presence of infection. So it's not the infection itself that uh, cause it, can cause death. It's the body's response to that infection. And um, what sepsis does is it causes loss of regulation of normal uh, physiologic processes. So it, it can cause the heart to... Um, function poorly, it can cause the lungs to not properly aerate blood, it can cause the liver to shut down, the kidneys to shut down, it can cause the brain to shut down. And what could be a potential cause of sepsis? Well, we're, we're familiar with um, uh, that type of bodies, that, that, that type of response the body has to COVID infection, but we're not talking about COVID from 1999. But um, the more common causes of sepsis um, include pneumonia and urinary tract infections. Viruses can cause sepsis as well. And is sepsis a possible cause of death in this case? Certainly. And what type of symptoms would we see from that? Uh, malaise, uh, lethargy, um, just not feeling right. Would there be any uh, stomach issues, gastrointestinal issues? Excuse me. There may be. It just depends on um, the organism and, and the body's response to that organism. And is, you mentioned pneumonia earlier, is pneumonia a potential cause of death in this case? Yes. Any symptoms of pneumonia? Well, pneumonia uh, can cause fever, again, malaise, lethargy, uh, cough, can cause vomiting, um, can cause irregular breathing. Could food poisoning be a potential cause of death? Yes. Uh, would, could it be a potential cause of death in this case? Yes. And what would the symptoms of that be? I think maybe we know that one, but what could the symptoms be? Well, you 
you can have a variety of symptoms. You wouldn't necessarily have all of them at the same time, but you can have abdominal cramping, diarrhea, vomiting, nausea. Dr. Turner, is it possible that the symptoms William was experiencing be something that was non-fatal? Yes. Like a, a cold or a, a virus, is that possible? Yes. And is it possible that he also had something else, perhaps unforeseen, that did cause him to die? Yes. Would, it be, would a seizure, an undiagnosed seizure disorder, be a potential cause of death? Yes. Can you walk us through a little bit about what that's like or how that causes death? or how um, obvious it would be to parents, please? Well, um, people who die of seizures, um, and children as well, um, often have seizures in their sleep, and um, it's particularly dangerous and, and potentially fatal if they have a seizure in their sleep while they're in the prone position or while they're lying on their stomach. Um, and in some individuals, the first seizure they have is also the last seizure they have. And that's because they pass away, right? Yes. Would a parent see signs or symptoms of this coming, a seizure disorder? No. Is there a risk a medical, medical professional would not see this coming? That's correct. What about undiagnosed diabetes? Could that be a potential cause in this case? Yes. Can you educate us a little bit about that, please? Well, children can develop um, or can have diabetes. Um, they can, there's uh, an entity known as juvenile diabetes. Um, the signs and symptoms may not be apparent until there's an illness, um, and that illness triggering um, what's known as diabetic ketoacidosis, which is um, a severe metabolic disorder. And can that cause death? Yes. Are there any other uh, heart conditions, brain conditions, abnormalities that could be a potential cause of death here? Certainly, you can have a, a viral infection of the heart, known as viral myocarditis, that can cause death. You can have um, an abnormality of the um, muscle cells of the, the heart that cause congestive heart failure or a fatal arrhythmia or a fatal irregular beating of the heart. Could electrolyte disturbances be a cause of death in this case? Yes. How would that work? Well, um, if there's severe uh, vomiting and diarrhea, that can deplete the body of its normal balance of electrolytes, sodium, potassium, chloride, and that can trigger a, a heart arrhythmia or fatal uh, arrhythmia of the heart resulting in death. Are you aware of any uh, liver disorders, genetic liver disorders, that would make a person uh, more prone to toxicity from acetaminophen or diphenhydramine? No. Would meningitis potentially be a cause of death? Certainly, yes. How does that work? Well, you can have viral meningitis or bacterial meningitis, and, and depending on how virulent the organism in is, the, um, the death can be rapid and can occur during sleep. All right. I've asked you about a lot. Dr. Turner, are there any others that are coming to your mind that could be potential causes of death here that might fit the symptoms? There, um, there can be gastrointestinal catastrophes, um, so um, the bowel uh, twisting on, its, on itself and cutting off blood supply to the bowel, and that can cause um, sudden death um, or rapid death. Uh, it would allow bacteria to get into the bloodstream and cause sepsis. It, it can also um, cause peritonitis or or infection of the abdominal cavity. Is there anything in, in the record of this case or anything from the symptoms described in this case 
that can aid you, a forensic pathologist, in determining a cause of death? The, the symptoms, as I understand it, are, are um, pretty generic, um, nonspecific. So there are any number of potential causes of death. Are there, are there several things that this could be for a child to exhibit those symptoms where a parent would not need to take a child in for medical treatment? Well, I've, I've seen that where a um, child has nausea and vomiting and um, dies at home because the parent can't see inside the body and know how severe the illness is. All right. In your review of this case, did you note anything else significant about uh, the other conditions of the remains? Uh, was there anything about the conditions of the remains uh, that you noted to be significant? Well, I, I noted um, that there was still maggot activity um, as photographed at the scene. Um, I also noted that um, doctors Terry and Gowitt described William's toenails being trim and neat. Um, the tufts of hair that were recovered at the scene um, weren't matted. Um, his teeth were intact. He didn't have any uh, cavities, according to Dr. Scowett and, and um, Terry. He also didn't have any fillings or restorations of his teeth. I believe you mentioned earlier, you've, you've worked child death autopsies before, right? Yes. Have you had uh, contact with maybe children's parents after autopsies are performed? Not, not very often, no. It's, um, um, if I have, it's been by phone. Um, most of the contact between parents and the office were uh, through the, uh, the investigator in the office. In your opinion, when you are uh, making opinions about the autopsies you perform, does the way parents react to their death, to the death of their child, inform your opinion? No. Why is that? <laughs> because there's a, a spectrum of reactions. People come from different backgrounds and uh, family environments where they deal with stress in different ways. So it's, it's not, to take that into account is not scientific. It, it introduces an element of bias. Dr. Turner, from your review of this case, is there any evidence to support a conclusion that William died from an overdose of acetaminophen or diphenhydramine? No. Is there any evidence to support a conclusion that the zygomatic fracture or any other damage to William's skeleton happened while William was alive? No. Is there any evidence to support a conclusion that the manner of death in this case was homicide? No. Thank you. Okay. All right, Cross. Yes, Your Honor. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Dr. Turner. Good afternoon. Now, you would agree with Dr. Gallat and Dr. Tice that you cannot determine a cause of death in this case. I do agree with that. And you would agree that you cannot determine the manner of death in this case. That's correct. Now, a medical examiner's determination of manner of death is different from the jury's determination. Isn't that correct? I agree. A medical examiner is looking at the medical aspects of the case and preparing an autopsy report. Yes. Correct? Yes. You are not making a legal decision, correct? That's correct. 
It's the jury's job to make a legal decision about the manner of death, correct? Yes. Let's discuss the skull fracture. You can't rule out traumatic injury while the child was alive, can you? No. You agree with Dr. Gowett, correct? I'm not sure what you're referencing. That you can't rule out traumatic injury prior to death. I can't rule it out, but the, the appearance of the skull with the other um, evidence of animal scavenging is in keeping with post-mortem damage to the skull. So the answer to my question is yes, you can't rule it out. I can't rule it out. And you can't rule out that there may have been traumatic injury combined with animal scavenging. Isn't that correct? That's correct. So you agree with Dr. Gowett? Again, I don't know what Dr. Gowett said. You didn't read his report? I read his report. I don't remember him saying that he can't rule out uh, traumatic injury. Did he commit to how the injury was occurred? No, he did not. So you agree with Dr. Gowett? You can't say how the injury occurred. I can say that more likely than not, that the damage to the skull was from postmortem animal scavenging. But you can't rule out that a traumatic injury occurred prior to death, correct? That's correct. Just like Dr. Gallet. That's correct. And just like the anthropologist in this case, Dr. Tice. That's correct. <laughs> now, I want to talk about the malnutrition um, symptoms. What kind of symptoms would a child had if they weren't getting enough to eat and drink? They would have uh, lethargy, lack of energy. And how long would it take for a child to die um, from not getting enough to eat and drink if there are no other complications? Well, it, it depends on the... <coughs> Uh, severity of the malnutrition and what their base state of health was, but children die of malnutrition um, due to infection, so it's infection exacerbates the condition, and infection can occur at any time, so a child can die within um, you know, a week of, of malnutrition or days and months. You'd agree that typically it takes a long time to starve a child in the absence of, of other contributing factors, just taking away food and water, correct? Typically. Yes, typically. And if a child was deprived of enough food and water that it actually caused their death, you'd agree that you'd, you'd see, you would likely see skeletal changes, correct? You would see skeletal changes if the malnutrition was of a long duration. Let's talk about food poisoning. What are some of the symptoms you see with food poisoning? So as I testified to earlier, with food poisoning, you get abdominal cramping, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. And typically, food poisoning corrects itself in most people. Isn't that right? Yes. Most people recover from food poisoning in a day or two without the need of any um, trips to the hospital or visits to the doctor. That's true. And when you do need to go to the doctor, it's often because you're vomiting and you have so much diarrhea that you're, you're becoming very dehydrated. That's correct. You didn't hear any evidence in the case about this child vomiting or having diarrhea, did you? I have not. Not even a little bit. I, I have no information on that. Let's talk about the acetaminophen and, and diphenhydramine. If a dead child has 
those drugs present in their body. And their parent has given a statement that they knew something was wrong with them, that they didn't want to talk, that they didn't want to get up. They weren't throwing up. They were lethargic, weak, tired, there's some gagging. Could that be consistent with being exposed to a toxic amount of either of those drugs? The um, toxic effects of acetaminophen is um, nausea, vomiting, and um, then skin coloration change, jaundice, ultimately. With diphenhydramine, um, it's drowsiness, so not so much lethargy, but drowsiness and irritability. So your, your testimony is that you're always going to see vomiting when you have a toxic exposure to acetaminophen. <coughs> no, not always. It's one of the one of the symptoms. Is it fair to say it can be a symptom? Yes. So these symptoms combined with the presence of the drug actually being in the body and having a dead child could be consistent with a toxic exposure to one or both of those drugs. Isn't that correct? Yes, I, I stated as such with uh, Mr. Bozart that the drugs um, could have been at a toxic level, but we just don't know and we can't know. So it's not correct that the evidence is inconsistent with a toxic exposure. That's correct. I want to talk about the medicines at issue. Acetaminophen, diphenhydramine, said Tylenol and Benadryl. Is that correct? Yes. And Tylenol and Benadryl are often found in over-the-counter medications that induce sleep. Isn't that correct? Well, Tylenol doesn't induce sleep, but Benadryl does. And, and let me be clear, the, the two medications together when they're put together in one over-the-counter medication. It's, it's often in a medication that induces sleep. Well, I just want to be clear that Tylenol has no contribution to inducing sleep. It's the ingredient that induces sleep is the Benadryl. I, I understand. My, my question is, when you find these two drugs in a product together, that product is usually intended to induce sleep, correct? Yes. Okay. I'm showing you exhibits 87 and 89. I'm sorry, 88. Do you recognize these exhibits? Yes. Um, what would 87 be? 87 is a liquid form of uh, Tylenol with with uh, Benadryl. Tylenol PM? Yes. And if you would just leaf through, take, take a look at the uses, side effects, directions, warnings. Would you, you see the printout is from the distributor of Tylenol's website, correct? Yes. Uh, do those warnings, uses seem consistent with uh, what you would expect for Tylenol PM? Sure. Uh, Your Honor, the state tenders 87 into evidence. Any objections? No objection. It's admitted. And then 88, um, does that appear to be an authentic package of Tylenol PM capsules? Yes. Uh, Your Honor, the state tenders 88 into evidence. Any objection? 88? No objection. Okay, it's admitted. Now, both these um, medicines, the, the capsules and the liquid, they're going to be found in the area of the pharmacy where you, you get sleep aids, correct? Cold or sleep, yes. In fact, there's actually a different section of the pharmacy for the cold medications. Yes. 
these items are, are separate from those? I don't know. We may shop at different pharmacies. Would it surprise you? I went to five different pharmacies yes, yesterday. I'm, I'm, I haven't finished my question, Your Honor. Well, Council's bringing up her experience. All right, if, can you rephrase the question if, in a I, hypothetical? Uh, I'm, I'm asking would it surprise her on, based on my experience? There's no bar against that, Your Honor. I think she's right. All right, overrule the objection. Well, would it surprise you that I went to five different pharmacies and in every one the, the PM medications were in a sleep-inducing sleep section and the cold medicines were somewhere else? No. Okay. Let's talk about the Tylenol PM. I wasn't able to find a liquid form. I've got the printout for you there in, in 87. The active ingredients are what? Acetaminophen and diphenhydramine. And what are the um, doses or the amount in a dose for Tylenol PM in the liquid form? Well, this appears, so this isn't a pediatric bottle, so this is an adult dose mm -hmm. of 1,000 milligrams of, of Tylenol and 50 milligrams of, of Benadryl. And is it common in your experience for the sleep aid section to have medicine for children that induces sleepiness? No. And there's a reason for that, isn't there? Children don't typically have sleep disturbances. And it's not safe for children to take medication to induce sleep. Isn't that correct? I don't know. That's outside my area of expertise. But all of these sleep-inducing medications are made for adults? Yes. And what is the adult dose for acetaminophen? A thousand milligrams. And diphenhydramine? 50 milligrams. Tell the jury what the recommended uses are for Tylenol PM. Pain reliever and nighttime sleep aid. So you get this if you're in pain or you're having difficulty sleeping because of pain? Yes. Is there a liver warning? Yes. Is it in bold? Yes. What does it say? Uh, severe liver damage may occur if you take more than recommended, basically. Um, and if you take it with other drugs containing Tylenol, or if you take, um, take the medication with alcohol. And that's in an adult? Yes. What does it say about children? This is not um, packaged for children. But what does it say? It doesn't say anything about children. It's not packaged for them. It doesn't say do not use in children under 12 years of age? That is on a different page, but yes, it does say that. And that warning's gonna be on the bottle that's sold in the store? Yes. Does it have an overdose warning? Yes. Does it say to contact poison control right away? Yes. That quick medical attention is critical? Yes. And to not take more than directed? Correct. Again, this is for adults. Yes. For children, it says do not use. That's correct. <laughs> the capsules aren't going to be any different, correct? They're going to have the same medications, the same warnings. Yes. Showing you exhibit 89, do you 
recognize this exhibit? Yes. Um, does it appear to be an authentic uh, bottle of ZZ Quill? Yes. Your Honor, the state tender is 89 in evidence. Any objection? Objection. All right, submitted. Now this is the VIX version of the same medication, correct? Yes. Has the same amount of acetaminophen? Yes. Same amount of diphenhydramine? Yes. And it has the same uses as the Tylenol PM? That's correct. For pain and to induce sleep? Yes. It also has a liver warning in bold. Yes. Uh, this one warns adults that liver damage can occur if you take more than four doses in a 24-hour period. Correct. And that's in adults. Yes. It says to keep out of reach of children. Do you see that? Yes. And it says do not use in children under 12 years old. Correct. this exhibit? I'm not familiar with the brand, but it's another nighttime sleep aid. Does it appear to be an authentic bottle of uh, Equate nighttime sleep aid? Yes. Your Honor, the state tender is 90 into evidence. Any objection? Objection. All right, 90 is admitted. And the Equate nighttime sleep aid uh, also has 1,000 milligrams of acetaminophen? Yes and 50 milligrams of diphenhydramine? Yes. Has the same uses of treating pain and inducing sleep? Yes. Has a liver uh, warning in bold? Yes. Says that liver damage can occur if you take more than four doses in a 24-hour period? Yes. And it says not to use in children under 12? Correct. These are all adult medications. Yes. They also do make children's formulas of medication. Isn't that correct? Yes. Now, you don't get a lot of combined over-the-counter medications for children, as we've already discussed, where you have more than one active ingredient in the same product. That's they don't make a lot of those, correct? That's correct. That's because in cases involving children, you really want to individualize their treatment. Isn't that correct? I'm not a pediatrician. So you're not familiar with um, how, how children are administered and prescribed drugs, common over-the-counter drugs? No, I'm more familiar with the toxic effects. So you're familiar with the toxic effects of over-the-counter drugs, but you don't have any training or knowledge of, of what would be prescribed to children? I'm not a prescriber. I'm a, a forensic pathologist. You're aware that children have different metabolisms than adults? Yes. That they break drugs down differently? I'm not sure what you mean by that. That children's bodies can break the drugs down differently than adults' metabolisms? Well, that's a very vague statement. I mean, are you saying that children break down the drugs into different metabolites than adults do, or? That they break them down differently. Well, Is that not a true statement? It's, it's a very vague statement. I don't know how to answer to a, a, a vague statement. I'm, I'm not sure you know what you mean by that. Is it an untrue statement that children metabolize drugs differently than adults? Are you talking about how quickly they metabolize them, or are you... In any you, scenario. I'm sorry? In any scenario. Well, they don't, they don't break down the drugs into different metabolites. That's not true. I didn't ask you if they break them down into different metabolites. I don't think you know what you're asking me. I'm, I'm 
I'm asking you if they have different metabolisms than adults. Are you talking about metabolic rate? Didn't you just agree that children have different metabolisms than adults? No, I didn't. You, you've that asked me that, and I've asked you to, to clarify that. Well, well, how about this? Isn't the dosage for all drugs in kids going to be less than what it would be for an adult? That's correct. And that's because their livers are still maturing? That's one reason, yes. And a child could get sick on an adult dose? Yes. So you want to minimize the potential side effects for children? Correct. And that's why you have children's formulas of medications like Benadryl and Tylenol? That's correct. you exhibit 91 do you recognize this exhibit yes and does that appear to be an authentic bottle of children's Tylenol yes your honor the state tenders 91 into evidence Any objection? Objection. Right. Submitted. and 92 do you recognize this exhibit yes does that appear to be an authentic bottle of children's Benadryl yes your honor the state tenders 92 into evidence Any objection? Objection. Children's Benadryl, it does not contain acetaminophen, isn't that correct? That's correct. It has 12.5 milligrams of diphenhydramine, correct? Yes. That would be a quarter of what's in one dose of the adult medications. That's correct. And the uses, tell the jury what you use children's Benadryl for. For runny nose, sneezing, itchy, watery eyes, um, hay fever, upper respiratory uh, allergies, and itching of the nose or throat. And it says, do not use to make a child sleepy, doesn't it? That's correct. The children's Tylenol, um, that does not contain diphenhydramine, correct? That's correct. How much acetaminophen does the children's formula have? One hundred and sixty milligrams. That is about a sixth of what's in an adult dose, in one dose of an adult formula. Isn't that correct? Yes. What are the uses for children's Tylenol? My senior eyes are being challenged by the fine print here. Let me see. Sore throat, headache, cough, fever, sneezing and running nose, and minor aches and pains. And what is the maximum dose of children's Tylenol in a 24-hour? might need to direct me to the packaging here. I don't see it. Do you see somewhere where it says the maximum is five doses? 
Thank you. It does say that. I, it was like five or three, five or three. Do not give more than five doses in a 24 hour period. That's correct. And five doses is still less than a single adult dose. Yes. Is that correct? Um, the children's Tylenol also has a severe liver damage warning, doesn't it? Yes. And as a warning, do not use to make a child sleep. That's correct. Okay. Also has an overdose warning. Yes. How many cases have you worked involving the remains of unidentified children? Very few. How many? I told you yesterday probably about three. And that's because typically children are identified very quickly. Yes. How many case how many cases have you worked where you were examining the bodies of children that were abandoned somewhere? Well, that would be the same. The same three? Yes. And one of those cases was a child that died while they were in the care of a friend of the father, correct? Yes. The friend abandoned the child's body in the woods. Yes. The child was found and an autopsy was performed. Yes. And the child had a ruptured intestine. Yes, from a defect in the intestinal tract, yes. Luckily, you found this, well not you, but law enforcement found this child, or family did, uh, before the child severely decomposed. Correct. And you had the intestines and bodily organs to examine. That's correct. Abuse was su suspected in this case, correct? Yes. And the friend of the father was charged with the child's death. Yes. And that case is still pending. Yes. Uh, one of the other cases was a young woman who claimed she didn't know she was pregnant, correct? Yes. She said that she unexpectedly gave birth to a stillborn child and disposed of the body. Yes. And that woman was charged. Yes. And that woman was convicted. Yes. I'm going to admit to this. We are bringing in other cases to compare them to ours. What, what's the relevance of this, Ms. Holler? The fact that the only two cases that prior to this one that this doctor has ever examined were related to criminal conduct on, on the well, that in and of itself is fine, but getting into the results of those cases is irrelevant. Your Honor, so she's been making the point that people have other people were charged in different cases is irrelevant. The state knows that. All right, I'm gonna can move on. Here. I'm gonna instruct the jury. Do you want me to give them an instruction? Yes, Your Honor. Not please don't work. Yeah, that's whether or not um, what's happened in other cases is irrelevant for purposes of this case, and you're not to consider that. Your Honor, respectfully, I disagree that a, a, a medical examiner whose whole job is to investigate and determine cause and manner of death in connection with criminal prosecutions has only had two cases of abandoned bodies and that's, both were connected to criminal prosecutions? I, whether or not they were connected, to, the two cases is fine, but whether or not they were connected to criminal prosecution or what the results were of those cases is irrelevant and not admissible. I'm going to instruct the jury to disregard it and ask counsel to move on. You also indicated yesterday that you had never performed an autopsy of a child who died of food poisoning. Isn't that correct? To my knowledge, yes. On 
on direct, you indicated that it's difficult working with decomposed remains. It can be, yes. And it, pre it presents challenges to performing an autopsy. To performing an autopsy and analyzing the results, yes. You would agree that hiding a body so that it naturally decomposes before it's located is a great way to conceal evidence. Objection, Your Honor. This is falls outside of the scope of medical exam. This is asking. I'll right. overrule the objection. I I don't know the intent of individuals in um, circumstances like this. I'm not I'm not asking you about the intent. I'm asking whether you would agree it would be a great way to hide evidence from you. It potentially is. I have no, you know, I don't think anybody can determine whether, when or whether a body will be found. Thank you. Redirect. state with several different medications, right? Yes. Is there anything different between the, besides dosage, between the active ingredient uh, in adult diphenhydramine and children's diphenhydramine? No. What about acetaminophen? Same thing. You were asked if there were many medications contain both for children. Is there, is there evidence that William received these two medications from one single dose of one medication? No. You were asked if there was a label that said do not use for children, right? Yes. Um, why would that be present on an adult medication? Because of the dosaging. But the same medication is available in other medicines designed for children? That's correct. There's also a question about if there's a warning to keep out of the reach of children. Is that right? Yes. Should we keep children's medicine out of the reach of children as well? Yes. Why is that? For safety reasons. You asked a lot of questions about the dosages of each, the recommended dose. Is that right? Yes. Do we know what dose William received? No. Do we know which drugs he received? Which name brand drugs he received? No. Do we know if it was a combined medication between one medication? No. Do we know how many doses William received? No. I wanted to ask you about a follow-up question about the animal scavenging. Was there anything about the scene of the crime that, sorry, scene of the location where the body was found that you found illustrative or important? Well, there, um, the skull was separated from the torso and you could see the effects of decomposition underneath the torso and surrounding the skull the mandible was separated from the skull. Um, other things um, related to the scene include um, before the skull was removed from the scene, it was photographed in place and the skull was lying on the left side with the right zygomatic arch area exposed. Is that significant to you? It's in keeping with um, the animals having access to, to the right zygomatic arch and their scavenging. Thank you so much. Can she be excused? 